All right, guys. The drug class. Woo! Um, this is my second time through this, so sorry if I don't sound as enthused as usual. This is no way to get an education. Nevertheless, I am going to go ahead and do your steroid lecture. And away we go. All right, well, what's ahead? I want to emphasize their dates in this presentation, but there are absolutely no dates on the exam from the steroid section. The point of this is just the take home messages. Ergogenic aids, aids to sports or physical appearance have been around as long as humans have been around. And so I just wanted to send that message home, but don't drive yourself nuts memorizing when Ben Johnson got the gold medal or anything like that. We're gonna get into some of the issues with drug testing this seemed as good a place to do it as any, although most folks are much more interested in it when we get to the cannabis section for reasons I'll never quite understand. But uh, I'm not going to ask you about half-lives on the exam. I just want to demonstrate that uh, drugs have vast differences in half-life across people and across drugs. We are going to do the acute, chronic, and related effects and there's a special vocabulary particularly for the chronic effects when it comes to steroids so we'll get into that and then more than anything I want you to finish this with a good feel for the cognitive behavioral therapies appropriate for body dysmorphia. With that in mind I'm going to make this a relatively smaller video and we'll just have two different ones. All right, so there's some key terms to understand when we're talking about steroids. And they all really have to do with separating them from the corticosteroids, or some people say the corticosteroids, which have to do with the adrenal glands, and they're completely something separate. The acute effects of these all have to do with cellular growth or cellular duplication, really, or uh, functioning in the same way as testosterone. So we've got the word androgenic. Andro essentially just means masculine. Uh, you may know the word misandrinous, hates men. Uh, so androgenic is generate masculine, promotes masculine changes in the body. Again, I'm sorry to read these, but I want to make it so you guys can listen to the lecture and do your laundry or chop your vegetables or, God forbid, wash your hands. Uh, in addition, we have the word anabolic, which just means literally increases growth, as opposed to catabolic, when cells are sort of destroying themselves or eating themselves or... Uh, getting eaten up, anabolic is to make more cells, to make an increase in muscular tissue. So the steroids were technically called anabolic androgenic steroids, which is essentially similar to testosterone, the stereotypical male hormone. And these steroids produce both the anabolic, make masculine, and the androgenic, I'm sorry, the anabolic both make grow and androgenic make masculine effects. But nobody wants to say anabolic androgenic steroids every time, so we just call them anabolic steroids. All right, we've got a quaint little cartoon where a cat has become huge, and the husband is underneath yelling out, Honey, I think I know what happened to my steroids. And the take-home message is just literally all multicellular organisms respond to something like this in order to grow or duplicate. And we certainly see this in... Uh, animals that we farm. So uh, definitely see uh, steer, cows, uh, chickens, other animals also get uh, steroids of one sort or another in order to increase their growth. And they've also been bred in order to be bigger. This is essentially the same set of issues. So as you can imagine, this is a concern if you're a uh, premenstrual little girl and eating meat that has these in there that's going to alter your hormone levels and does alter your hormone levels for anyone because these increase cell growth there are also increases for a number of negative consequences as, as we're going to discuss all right and these are what these look like but unfortunately uh the underground market is filled with all kinds of fake ergogenic aids of one form or another uh the word erg just means energy so anything that's going to generate energy generate improvement uh, these are, are a part of that. So back in the day when they used to have these muscle magazines on sale everywhere, these would be 
<clears throat> advertised in this kind of underground throwaway mags that would go around the gyms in certain towns. God only knew what you were getting, and if uh, you really believed in it, the placebo effect probably kicked in a lot and worked out a lot harder, and then you could swear to your friend that it really did work, and particularly if you spent 50 bucks on it and then uh, adding to the credibility, but you didn't see a lot of randomized clinical trials on those things that were uh, in the underground market. You just had to kind of hope for the best. This was a big deal when I lived in Los Angeles, of course, and uh, LA in particular had you know a lot of steroid abusers. I lived in West Hollywood where this was uh, just part of the culture. But we hardly invented this notion of ergogenic AIDS, and it's uh, not always a comprehensible choice of drugs, but uh, all the way back in 300 BC, apparently there were some Greek athletes doing the marathon, a run from marathon to Thermopylae, and they had used hallucinogenic mushrooms in order to enhance their uh, performance on this. I'm hoping they were microdosing rather than doing so much that they just felt at one with Thermopylae and found themselves in marathon later just in their minds. But the bottom line was we've clearly been doing this for millennia. Obviously, folks who are competing want to be the winners, and away it goes. It does kind of underscore some of our values and make us have to face some curious thoughts we have about what it means to win or what it means to have a particular appearance, and it's going to lay the foundation for our cognitive behavioral treatments, as we will see. So one of the more famous cases, we're already into the 1880s here, a Welsh cyclist died in a big cross-country bike race where he had uh, basically been discovered to have both opiates and cocaine in his system after his death. Now you can imagine a painkiller and a stimulant like that, along with that extra narcissism that cocaine seems to produce and uh, perceived harm. Uh, basically here was a guy who was just setting himself up for, yes, a uh, serious injury, and then finally he, he died on one of these long cross-country races. And by the mid-1950s, we're starting to see this in the Olympic Games to the point where people were really generating a lot of concern. So the Eastern Bloc companies, when the USSR was still around, you'd see a whole lot of folks with the signs of acromegaly, which we're going to get into, but basically that long jaw, some of the distortions in the forehead, the bones that clearly hadn't stopped growing were growing, so they'd have big hands and feet. You'd see these shot putters who, you know, got their entire hand around the shot put, and unfortunately the female athletes often took these without uh, any kind of informed consent and then later lost all their fertility. This was a pretty serious problem, and the Olympic committees finally started looking into them. By 88, the drug testing industry and then the anti-drug testing industry were sort of evil twins on the same problem. Bottom line was they were testing folks if you were in the top three, if you were a medalist, and then if you tested positive, you were disqualified. This was the beginning of some pretty serious interventions on these and uh, quite the market for new steroids that were going to somehow sidestep the testing. By 2000, there was an anti-doping pledge in the Olympic oath. So when you basically took your oath to be an Olympic athlete, you swore allegiance to mom and apple pie and your country's flag and things like that. But there was also a commitment to not use any illicit ergogenic aid. And so then the list of what you were allowed and what you weren't allowed got uh, more hairy and crazy. So uh, propranolol, basically some of, the, some of the drugs that would decrease shaking were uh, banned for folks who were in sports like archery or riflery, you know, anything where you had to shoot in a, in a modest uh, baseline tremor was going to be a problem. You couldn't use a drug to sidestep that. And then by 2004, there was a new steroid. The designer steroid was called THG. And the track and field athletes and baseball players did not have some of the same rules. And so baseball players were purportedly using it all the time. And it wasn't part of their arrangement, whereas in football and basketball they were. So they were trying to make some cross-sport consistencies on this. It really does raise the question, hey, from a civil liberty perspective, shouldn't I be allowed to do really whatever I want with my own 
body. And yet we also want people to be able to succeed in sports or uh, have an attractive body without having to put their health at risk. So how do we pit these two issues across from each other? That's going to be our sort of recurring theme in trying to bring up something about the ethics of these issues.